Hello and welcome back to the screwed up recording, so let's try again. Uh, so the first thing we'll talk about are the questions on the one minute papers from last time. Uh, the first one was when should one use uh, the reasoning combinator where both brackets are pointing the same way. So this one is pointing the other way around, so to speak. Um, and the short answer is you use that whenever you want to use the symmetric version of inequality. Um, so here's a short example where we want to show a kind of combination of transitivity and symmetry where we know that x is equal to y and then we know that z is equal to y. So if we have two things equal to y and we want to show that then they must be equal to each other, right? So x is equal to z. Um, so we've introduced x, y, z, a proof that x is equal to y and a proof that z is equal to y and we would like to use the equational reasoning combinators to prove this. So we'll start the usual way. We say begin something equals by some proof something QED and maybe we'll line them up like this. Okay, we reload. Uh, we solve everything. So the left hand side must be x, the right hand side must be z. And then we just have to fill in the steps that takes us from here to here, right? Uh, so we can look at what we have available. Um, make this a bit bigger, a bit bigger still. And we see that we have a proof that x is equal to something, and we want to go from x to something. So we can put in that step and say, well, I know how to get from x to y. And if we're being paranoid, we'll See, here we need x equals y, so we can put in the thing we have. Okay, so we've taken one step, and then here now we would like to go from y to z. Uh, and a priori, we have no way of going from y to z, we only have a way to go from z to y, right? So we can either either use sim of that proof, z equals y. Uh, but sim is not in scope, so we have to fully qualify it, okay? And that would work and it would be done, and that's what I normally do. But if you want to be a little bit slicker, then there's a special combinator for using sim of this thing, which is that we change the direction of this thing to point the other way, like that. So before I did that, uh, the goal was y equals z, and if I now reload, then we see that the goal has turned into z equals y. So if I still do a sum of this, then I've undone the work I've done, and, and now I have something that's the wrong way around. So the point is that I shouldn't use sim here, I should just use the thing, and then, then it fits. Right. So you use it when you want to reverse one of, one of the proofs of inequality that you have. Um, so I hope that that was helpful. Um, but again, if you don't want to use it, you can just use sim in side here instead. Okay, let's line these up a little bit. Okay, so that was the first question. Second question is, could we have some more examples of generalizing the induction hypothesis? And yes, you can. Uh, this is the second time we tried this because the recording didn't work the first time. But the point is that this lecture is all about generalizing the induction hypothesis. Uh, so there you go. And the final one minute paper question was about we used postulate last time. And postulate is like a keyword, uh, like variable, and it allows you to introduce something. So you can say postulate um, something like primes is a set. And the point is that if it's under the postulate keyword, then we don't actually have to give an implementation of this. So normally, if we don't use postulate, and I say prime to the z, then we say that this is declared, but it's not defined. And that's a bad thing, right? Uh, but using postulate, we can get away with saying, well, telling Agda, we're just going to pretend that this thing exists. We don't know what it is, and we can use it. And this has two main uses. So you could either use it to postulate something you know is true or something you can't be bothered to provide. So I think that's what we used last time. We postulated that certain equations were true. Um, and that's, of course, dangerous, because if they are not true, then you might have just 
introduced a way to prove anything you want, right? If I postulate that zero is equal to one, then from that I can get a lot of, lot of consequences that I might not want. Um, so that could be dangerous. So you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't use postulate in any of your proofs. Um, but it's sometimes a good way to get to the interesting parts of the proof rather than getting stuck on the boring details of, of something you think is obviously true. Um, and another use of postulate is if you postulate that certain functions exist, then maybe you can implement these in Haskell, but you don't want to implement them in Agda. And if you now compile your Agda code via Haskell, then you can hook them up uh, to do your postulated things. And then you can use the postulated things from within inside Agda and it will still run once you've uh, hooked them up after compilation. And there's some certain pragmas for saying, okay, I have this postulated thing and I want to turn it into this Haskell thing when I, when I actually compile and run my program. Um, but most of the time you can safely ignore the postulates and you shouldn't use it in your homework because that's clearly cheating, right? Okay, but now let's move on to this second question and spend the rest of the lecture on it. Uh, examples of generalizing reduction hypothesis. So I'll just remove that and reload the file. Uh, so let's just look at some examples and hopefully it will become clear what we're doing from here. Um, so the idea is that we have this type of binary trees uh, where in this particular type, so there's many different ways you can do binary trees. You can store data in the nodes, you can store it in the leaves, you can store it in nodes on a Monday and leaves on a Tuesday or something like this. Uh, but this particular binary tree, it's parameterized by a set A and we're storing data in the leaves, right? So the leaf constructor carries an element of type A and then the node just carries two subtrees, a left subtree and a right subtree, right? Um, so we have this type of tree, uh, we have some variables and uh, the first thing we want to do is we want to take such a tree and produce a list of elements uh, of and the idea is that we want this to do something sensible. We don't want it to return just the empty list. And uh, we are going to choose to traverse this tree from left to right, uh, because uh, it's rather Western-centric of me, I guess, where I'm thinking of things starting from the left and then going to the right. Uh, and again, that, that's not the only choice. I could go right to left, or I could, on even levels, I could go left to right, and on odd levels, I could go right to left or whatever, but now I'm going to keep it simple. So I go to left to right, and that means that if this tree I start with is balanced, uh, is it, uh, so it's, it's already sorted, then I'm going to get a sorted list out, but that's maybe not so important. But okay, let's see if we can define this function. So as usual, I take argument t, and I can't say which list to give here without actually looking at the tree. So I'm going to pattern match on t. Okay, I get two cases. I'm going to rename the variables here. Okay, so it's either a leaf or it's a node. And I have to say which list do I want to give back for these cases. If it's a leaf, then I have one element. So I can take that A and I can make a singleton list which contains A at the head and then the empty list as the tail, right? So it's one li a list with one element, which is exactly the A. And now if I have a node, well, then I said I wanted to go left to right. So I can first do a two list of the left subtree. That's going to give me a list. I could finish there, but then, uh, then I'm throwing away the right subtree. That doesn't seem right. So I can do the left one. Then I can append that to whatever I get if I also go down the right subtree, right? And that's still going to be a list. This is using the append uh, function on lists. Right. Okay, so we can test this. Let's say I want to get the list of say natural numbers, and it's going to be a two list of some tree. Okay, so we don't have natural numbers, so I'm going to import them. Okay, and the tree I want is going to be a node of something something. This is going to be a node of something something. So maybe this is a leaf of seven. And maybe this is a node of leaf twelve. And leaf one. And here I'm going to say leaf forty-two. 
Okay, uh, so I wrote a tree and then I converted it to a list. So I can run this, control C, control N, test. And I say I get out 7, 12, 1, 42, which is 7, uh, 12, 1, 42. So I get them from left to right, right, as we thought. Um, so that's fine. It's a perfectly fine definition. Um, but if I were to run this on a really big tree, then I would notice that this append here is actually going to traverse this list, the left subtrees, over and over again. Right? Uh, so we're going to get a quite inefficient algorithm because append is just going through the left of the list all the time, even if we keep adding things to the right, for example. Right? Um, so you might remember this from, from other functional programming classes you might have taken. Um, that we could introduce an accumulator and that would solve this problem. So let's do that. So rather than just taking a tree and producing a list uh, with a append in the recursive call, we're going to add things to the accumulate list instead. So we have a tree and we have an accumulator and then we pat a match on the tree still. Uh, so now when we get to the leaf, rather than just returning the singleton list, like we did up here, we're going to put an A on top of whatever we have already accumulated. So that's going to do this kind of appending, but one at a time. Right. So here I'm going to say A followed by the accumulator. And if I have a left and a right subtree, then I am going to to two list of the left, uh, but rather than just saying the accumulator here, I'm going to use the recursive call on the right to be my new accumulator. So to list of R of back. So that uh, doesn't work because I used the wrong function. Okay, so that at least type checks. Okay, uh, but, and then, okay, how do we kick this off? Well, we start with the empty accumulator, right? So now we could try our test. And our new function. Okay, and I can run test prime. And I see I get 7, 12, 1, 42, which was what I got for test as well. Right, so I could even try to do a little test where I say that test is equal to test prime. And I'm claiming that refl is a proof of this. Okay, and it is. So uh, we see that we, we seem to have gotten it right. I mean, by testing. But of course, testing is not a proof, right? We just have these particular case and maybe our functions happen to work for these. Uh, so we could try to actually prove that for any tree t, we get the same result if you use the prime version and the original version, right? So this was the original one, which we maybe believe that it's doing the right thing, because it's doing kind of the obvious thing, right? And then we had the prime version where we think that things are actually going to be more efficient because there is no appending going on anymore here. We're just uh, consing single elements. So we're not going to keep re-reading the left subtrees of things. Um, but so that's the, the clever version, but it's not so clear that it's actually doing the right thing, right? I mean, you could swap the left and the right here. And, and it's not completely obvious without thinking that that's the wrong thing to do and this is the right thing to do, right? So it's great if we can prove that the efficient version actually gives the same result as the obviously correct version. So let's see if we can do that. And how do we do it? Well, it's same thing as before, where we want to show that these two things are equal, but these things are defined by pattern matching on the T. So both the left hand side and the right hand side are stuck because the t is unknown. These are doing different things if it's a leaf or a node. 
So it's stuck because of T, so we should pattern match on T. Right. Okay, do the traditional renaming. Okay, we get two cases. So it's good to start with the base case because if that's uh, if that's not right, then nothing will be right. Uh, but thankfully here, it looks like the base case is actually right. That works. Okay, and then um, what about this case? Uh, right, this is what we have to prove. Um, so what do we actually have? Well, we could put our recursive calls just to see what they give us because we are entitled to this function applied to L and this function applied to R because L and R are smaller trees, right? So I can say, okay, whatever this is, and I H left, induction hypothesis left, is going to be what I get if I run this function on the left subtree. Okay, I reload, and I can solve this goal, and it's telling me that, well, the prime version and the unprimed version agree on L, okay? And similarly, I'm entitled to the same thing for the right subtree. Let's change all of this manually. Okay, so I know that. And then I could maybe start looking at this. So this is what my goal is. But if I ask what the goal really is, control U, control U, control C, control comma, then we see that these things compute a little bit. Um, so this is really my goal. So I can start by saying, begin left hand side. and then I suppose I better open equation of reasoning like we did up here. So you can either do it in a let or you can do it in a where or you can do it globally. Okay, so I open that, that means I have access to the beginning and so on. And then we can start looking at, at what we have here. So this thing here is actually a two list prime of R, right? And I know that two list prime of R is the same as two list of R. So it seems like a good idea to make this move where I change that. Okay, and I know how to do it. Well, the two list ac of L stays the same on both sides. So I can do a con of List ac of L and something. That's going to show that two list ac of L of something equals two list ac of L of something else. That's what I want. And here, this is exactly my induction hypothesis on the right subtree. So that's great. Um, we moved from here to here. So this is looking a little bit more like this, right? And now we would ideally want uh, to move from here to here. But we see that we are kind of stuck because the induction hypothesis we have is only talking about two list prime. So remember that this was defined to be two list arc of L and the empty list. So I've just written that out. We see that I'm just still happy with saying that this has the same type. But what I have here is talking about two list ac of L of something which is not necessarily the empty list, right? Because this thing is in fact never going to be the empty list. Two list is always producing a non-empty list. Uh, so this induction hypothesis we have here is useless for finishing this proof. And the problem is that IHL 
is not strong enough. And the solution is to generalize it. So we started off with the property we wanted, that these two things are the same, uh, but it turned out that that wasn't strong enough. We got an induction hypothesis, but it's talking about a specific empty list, whereas we need it to talk about this list. Uh, so usually the right thing to do to fix this is to generalize the induction hypothesis. And usually the right thing, so this is not mechanical. Um, you have to think of how to generalize it, right? So, so basically everything we did up until this point was mechanical in the sense that we, we stated the property we wanted, we just looked at all the recursive calls and saw what they applied, but then we got stuck here because the mechanical thing didn't quite work this time. So we have to generalize the hypothesis, uh, which means that we have to come up with a more general property that can be specialized to the one we want, right? Um, okay, and if we think a little bit about what a natural way to state this is, uh, so the problem is that the accumulator we talked about here was only the empty list, but we should say something about what happens for an arbitrary accumulator. And if you think about what, what this probably means, well, then a sensible looking property is that if we take the accumulator version for an arbitrary accumulator, ACK, then we get the two list of T on top of the accumulator, ACK, right? Because up here in the def definition, we see that that's kind of what's going on here. We put whatever we wanted to the left of the accumulator. Okay, so we could try and prove this instead. So now we have a T and we have an ACK. And this is our goal. Okay, so that's just what we had. And we can again play why is it stuck? Well, this thing here is stuck because two list ACK is pattern matching on T. And thankfully, this thing is also stuck because T list is pattern matching on T. And the append is stuck because we don't know what the left hand side lift list is, right? So everything points to the fact that we should probably be pattern matching on T. So let's do that. Okay, two cases. T is either a leaf or a node. If it's a leaf, what do we need to prove? Well, thankfully, this is still looking good, right? So before up here in the leaf case, our goal was that. A followed by the empty list is A followed by the empty list. That has now been generalized to the goal that A followed by the accumulator is the same as A followed by the accumulator. But that's equally true and equally obviously true. So refer works here as well. Right. Um, uh, so that's a good sign that at least we, we still we haven't lost the base case. But now what about this case? Well, we can do the same thing. Well, we say begin something equals to something QED where, okay, then we open the equational reasoning so we have access to these things. Um, we get the things we are entitled to, namely the induction hypothesis. Uh, remembering to put in the new name of the thing. Does that work? Yes. Okay, solve for these. Okay, this is what we need to prove. Um, what do we have here? Uh, right, it's saying that for every list ACK1, two list ACK of L and ACK1 is two list of L and ACK1. Okay, so the problem here is that it's saying list of underscore because the A is not in scope. So I think we could bring the A into scope. And then here we can say list A. Yeah. Okay, or alternatively, if you don't want to do that, we could actually say 
for all at one because the type of this should be inferable anyway. Yes, okay, and now let's change this to arc prime because it looks a bit tidier, I think. Oops, no idea what happened there. Second string should be prime. Yes, okay, so this is the induction hypothesis for the left subtree. And we similarly have one for the right subtree, right, which is saying the same thing, but with an R. So let's say for ac prime. Okay, so that's what we know just from the induction hypothesis. And now we need to somehow go from here to here, right? Underscore here. It's probably not an underscore. I think it's just it's the leftover thing. Okay, uh, so we should probably use the induction hypothesis, and we say that actually both of them could apply, right? Because here we have two list of L and some list, which matches the left hand side here. Or we could work on the inside where we have a two list of ACK of R and some list that matches this. Um, so maybe we start with this one for simplicity. So, okay, what do we get? Uh, so I want to change the left hand side to the right hand side. So I get this plus plus and then whichever I choose the ACK prime to be. And I want that to be this list, right? Uh, okay, so it looks like that's what we want. Let's see if it fits. Okay, so the list I want is this one. Okay, that's good. Uh, so we took one step from here to here and then we want to get rid of this two list ACK of R. So we need to take another step. Um, this induction hypothesis tells me that this is actually the same as this, right? So two list of R plus plus ACK. Okay, this was IH R of ACK, I think. Okay, so that looks good, but then I also have a two list of L plus plus in front of both of these. So that's another case of Kong, right? Okay, and I can use a section like this. Yeah, okay. Right, so that takes me to here. And then what I have here looks quite good, except that the brackets are different, right? So I still have the same things in the right order, but here I have the brackets on the right and here I have the brackets on the left, right? So um, let's see what we can do about that. Uh, do we have, we have the plus plus a sock, which is exactly what we want. Okay, so this is saying that plus plus is associative, which means these things. So if I give it three lists, then it doesn't matter how I bracket it. So here on the left, I have the brackets on the left, and here on the right, plus plus has been defined to be right associative, so I'm just not actually printing the brackets around this. Uh, so what are my lists? I'm in the wrong goal, okay. Plus plus a sock of these three lists. Okay, um, so that again gives me something that looks about right, except that it's the wrong way around, right? So this is a use case for saying, well, actually, I want a symmetric version of this. Okay, 
So what I have stays the same, but the goal has now switched around, right? And now we see that this actually matches directly. So that finishes the proof, right? Um, so we see this time it worked because we had generalized the induction hypothesis and we had to be a little bit creative in coming up what the generalized property should be, right? Uh, but now, of course, we still want this, right? So I'm going to just comment this out. Does this actually follow? Put it here, maybe. Okay. So what do we get if we do another begin this equals something something equals what we want? Where we open the equational reasoning. Okay, uh, so we see it's yellow because Agda doesn't know what our middle step is, but I need to say that the way to get from here to somewhere is to use the generalized property for t and the empty list. If I fully normalize this, I see that matches my left hand side, right? Okay, and then I can solve what this needs to be. Okay, so we see that the generalized property gets me to two list of t plus uh, the appended with the empty list, right? Which should be the same as just two list of t. Right? And I think this is in the standard library, it's called something like plus plus identity right is that right uh, plus plus ah okay I guess we need to import it And does it give me the right thing? Yes, it looks right. So if I give this a list, it will tell me that that list appended with the empty list is that list. So the list I want is to list of t, right? Okay. Right. So the generalized property gets us almost all the way there, and then we have to fix up this little equational thing in the end as well. Right? And then we really get the property we really wanted from the generalized one. Right. Um, so that's one example of actually generalizing the induction hypothesis. And if you think about what's happening, then two list, these two versions of two list is basically turning all the nodes in this tree into appends but they are bracketing them in different ways. So the, the naive one is kind of bracketing in a balanced way. And the efficient one is bracketing things to the right, which means that all of these appends are going to be efficient because it's just adding one element, right? But in the end, we still get the same list because plus plus is associative, basically. And in some sense, we saw that falling out of this proof, right? Where the interesting step at the end, after we've done all of the things we've been entitled to for by the induction hypothesis, was really just plus plus or SOC. Um, okay, so we can also look at one more example of how to do these things. Uh, so this is more of a programming example and a proving example, even though a lot of the time these things come up when you're trying to prove something. Uh, but the line between proving and programming is quite blurry anyway, right? So. Um, let's consider that we want to produce a list of all the subtrees of a given tree. Uh, so we say that, well, the whole tree is always a subtree. And if we have a subtree somewhere on the left, then 
that gives rise to a subtree also in, in a node with a left and a right subtree, right? So a subtree of a given tree is going to be a bunch of left rights, and then finally you say, okay, and now I want the whole tree, right? Okay, so let's see if we can write a function that takes a tree and then gives us a list of all the subtrees. Uh, so let's see what happens. Take a tree t. Okay, and then again, I don't know what to do before I look at t, because if t is just a leaf, well, let's just do it. If t is a leaf, then the only subtree is the tree itself, right? So I can say self, and then that's my only thing. Whereas if I have L and R, well, then the whole thing is always a subtree. That's fine. But now I could also recursively look at the subtrees of L and R, right? So I should that in aware again. I have the left subtrees. And I have the right subtrees. Ask Agda what are the types of these things? Okay, the solve for this, the solve for this. So I say I get the list of subtrees for the left tree, and I get the list of subtrees for the right tree. So now what I would like is I would like to take these subtrees and then append them with the other ones, right? Um, but if I just do the recursive call like this, then I get the subtree of L. Uh, so what I want is I want to put a left constructor in front of all of these, right? So I could do a map, except that I haven't imported map, but you could imagine writing a map function for lists and then I could, I could do that, but then Again, this is going to be quite inefficient because we are going to keep, well, first of all, appending, but also keep mapping the same kind of constructors over and over again over these things, right? So we could try to generalize what we're trying to do to do it more efficiently. Um, and the idea is that rather than just immediately returning the subtrees, then we also keep track of a way to turn, embed the subtrees into the thing we really want. And then in the end, we're going to get a list of Bs. And we can get the original function back out by starting off by having the identity function as our embedding from subtrees to subtrees, right? But as we go deeper into the tree, we're probably going to do different things. Um, so let's see if we can do this. So we get the t, get an embed function, and we have to make a list of b's. Okay, so I get the pattern match on the tree again. If it's a leaf, then I want a list of b's. Okay, um, so I can say, so what do I want here? I want the only subtree I had was the whole tree, the self, right? So self is a subtree of something, and I have the embed function, which can turn subtrees of leaves, so in particular self, uh, in fact only self, that's the only inhabitant of this type, right? Uh, so I can turn self into a B, if I do embed of self, so that's going to give me a B, and I only want one subtree here because there's nothing else. So I can say, okay, let's just take this singleton, right? Okay, uh, so now we see in particular, if I now start with the identity as the embed, then I get the same result here. I just get self as what we tried to have up here, right? Singleton self, singleton embed self. So identity of self is self. But what do we do here in the node case? Okay, we can try the same thing, right? So before we said, well, we should take self, 
and then we should try and uh, try to do the two recursive calls. So let me actually steal all of this. Okay, um, but here we're doing the generalized version, so we need to also supply some kind of embed function. And if we just try self here, then this won't work, right? We can load it and see what happens. Because self is a subtree, but we want a list of Bs. So we have to embed the self. And that's going to get us a B. Okay. Um, so these, okay, I just copied all of this, but actually what I get from the induction hypothesis is a list of Bs again, right? So this happened to type check because I could pick B to be that thing, but I don't have to. And now I can actually give these, so I'm going to in some brackets to make it work like this. Okay, so I'm doing an inductive call on the left subtree and on the right subtree, but I see that the embed function I have, well, that's going to take a subtree of the node and give me a B for some B. Uh, so if I start by actually using the left constructor of subtrees, and that's going to take me from subtrees of L into subtrees of the nodes. And then the med function I started with is going to take me to the B, right? So if I do this composition, uh, right, okay. So now the B, to be explicit, that this is the B I want. Uh, did I get this wrong? All right, I first want to do left. Okay, so left is going to take me from subtree of L to subtree of nodes, and then embed is going to take me from subtree of nodes into B, which is what I want. Right. So what this means is that as we go down the left subtree, our embed function is going to put one more left constructor on top of things, right? So then when we actually get to the leaf or when we get to Embedding things is always going to put a, le a left in front of it. And similarly here, we can do an embed of composed with right if we're going down the right subtree. Right. Um, okay, uh, so let's test this as well. Test sub. I want to call subtrees prime of the tree we had up here. Uh, okay, test three, I guess. There wasn't actually a problem, I see. This is me being stupid. Okay. Uh, so if we take the subtrees of the tree, okay, it type checks, and let's run it, see what we get. Control C, Control N. Uh, what did I run? I want to test sub rather than test. Okay, so we see that the subtrees of this tree is either the whole tree, or it's left of self, or it's left of left of self, or it's left of right of self, blah, blah, blah. Why is that? It's because the tree looks like this, right? So we have the whole thing, or we can go left once, or we can go left twice, or we can go left, right, and then we have these, which we have inside folders. 
Uh, but we see that these are indeed the subtrees that we want, right? So we're by pushing more and more things on this, again, kind of accumulatory thing, uh, we get the combinations of left, right that we want as we go down the tree. Um, so that's a more of a programming example of, of generalizing what we want by saying, well, we want to keep track of how to embed things into the thing we really want. And, and this way we can do it on the fly rather than afterwards by traversing the tree or the list over and over again with a map function. Uh, so the important questions are why is it stuck in the sense that we had to pat match on the same things to make the proofs go through. Uh, it's the question why is it not gender enough? So this is the, the tricky bit where we have to be a bit creative to come up with the solution. So we had to come up with this embed function and we had to come up with this generalized property up here, right? That uh, took, also took the accumulator into account and didn't just work when the accumulator was the empty list. Um, and there's also the more softer question of is it human readable and maintainable where it might be nice to use the equational reasoning to see what's actually going on in the steps rather than having a, a list of, of trans and sim and so on. Right? Um, but that's of course harder to quantify. Okay, that's it for today. <laughs>